Good morning, everyone, and welcome to day two of our summit. I'm glad to have you guys all back. Um, today's presentation will be patient and caregiver recommendations for hospital visits. And our speakers will be Teresa Imperato. Um, she is a registered nurse and an employee of ALS United Greater New York. Um, she has been working in the ALS centers and clinics for over 20 years and has heard the good and bad stories of patients visiting the hospital in an emergency. She is now going to take that history and use it as a guide for you and your next emergency visit when applicable. Mm -hmm. I also wanna welcome Bruce Miller, a dedicated caregiver for his wife, Susan. Um, she, when her diagnosis and symptoms began in early 2020 um, and the diagnosis mm -hmm. confirmed in 2021, shortly after his wife, Susan, began losing her abilities for independently performing ADLs, otherwise known as activities for daily living, and his role as caretaker began along with the help of his devoted twin sons, amazing daughters-in-law and grandchildren. Together, they navigate the challenges of the ALS journey. So welcome, Bruce and Teresa. I'll leave it up to you guys now. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, thanks for the lovely introduction, Donna. I appreciate it. Um, I'm Teresa Imperato. I'm one of the nurses at ALS United Greater New York. I'm here today with Bruce Miller, the husband and caregiver for his wife, Susan Miller. Susan's disease has progressed and now she's in a wheelchair all day. She has an all calm device to communicate and is now fed 100% via a feeding tube. She also, also uses non-invasive ventilation. Over her disease progression, Susan has been to the emergency department a few times for various reasons and has been hospitalized a couple of times um, during those visits. Today, Bruce and I are going to highlight one recent emergency department visit and subsequent hospitalization in the hopes that we can help you make your emergency room visit and maybe hospitalization smoother and uncomplicated. So this particular um, event that we're going to talk about is when Susan's um, feeding tube unfortunately had some complications quite some time after she had gotten the feeding tube. And her issues and symptoms progressed to the point where the ALS center team advised Bruce to take her to the hospital. The situation was stable enough that Bruce was able to put Susan in the car and drive her to the emergency room. They do have um, a handicap accessible van. So he was able to get her in and out um, at the hospital without much problem. I do want to point out that had had Bruce called 911, he likely would have been taken, or Susan likely would have been taken to another hospital, not the hospital of their choice. Because um, and Bruce may have had to follow her, or a family member may have had to follow the ambulance in their own car. <clears throat> so Bruce's situation here was a little bit different than if you called 911. Donna will talk a little bit more about 911 later. Um, Bruce, knowing that he, knowing about the 911 situation, he did select to put Susan into a vehicle and drive him on his own. <clears throat> um, Bruce, now I'm going to ask you to recall Susan's visit to the ED on this particular time when her feeding tube was giving, giving you and everybody problems. And, um, just tell me a little bit about your situation. Did you take her alone to the emergency room or did you have another caregiver or family member come with you on this trip? Yeah, no, it was like a, like the early evening. So, so I just took her myself. I took her into the van cause it's really easy and just drove her straight to the hospital of our choice. Um, we went right directly to the uh, emergency room, the emergency entrance. And were you able to um, take her right into triage? How were you able to do that? Yeah, well, most of the hospitals here, we're on Long Island. Most of the hospitals here on Long Island actually have ballet parking. So uh, although Susan was not in excruciating pain or so, so, you know, we just made, when we drove up to the uh, emergency department, we just ballet parked the car. I wasn't going to worry about that at that point and got her into the triage area. Excellent. Um, and 
like when you got her in there, were you all ready with all of her symptoms, like maybe written down on a piece of paper or did you practice what you were going to say when you got there so that you could go right into triage and tell them all of Susan's symptoms and issues current? No, yeah, no, we, uh, I know what the symptoms were. Nothing was written down. Okay. What I do is, which we'll talk about later is I keep a little backpack, what I call my emergency bag, which Teresa will show you a slide later. It really contains all the information that she would need that I don't have to go looking when you get to a point and you think you're going to have to do or you have a hospitalization, you don't want to start running around trying to put things together. In our case, maybe here I may have had the time because it wasn't a painful situation, but you you don't want to start. You want to be prepared in ahead of time. If this has to happen, hopefully you never will. Yeah. So even though it wasn't pain, Susan's only source of um, nutrition is mm -hmm. the feeding tube. So it could be a desperate situation if the tube isn't working. So Susan doesn't speak. I mentioned that before. Um, so do you have, do you carry with you Susan's healthcare proxy and power of attorney that grants you permission to speak on her behalf? Yeah, Susan. And then what I do is in that bag, which I guess there's a slide later in the thing, by the way, I call it my emergency bind, my emergency binder, which has all those critical documents that you're going to need in the hospital. Uh, you're going to need a healthcare proxy. If you don't have one, the hospital is going to ask you to kind of, they'll, they'll present you with one, but it's always better to you know have yours pre prepared ahead of time. Power of attorney, the essential documents, it's all ready to go. I uh, Copies of her insurance cards, anything that I possibly need to show them in an, at, either at the emergency room, the hospitalization, or the doctor, I have in this binder, so I don't have to go looking for stuff. Yeah, the uh, healthcare proxy is an important document, and anyone over the age of 18 in New York State should think about assigning a proxy because if you are left unable to speak or you're like in a coma, unconscious, and you want something done or not done, uh, you have to have a proxy there to speak on your behalf. Otherwise, the doctors will decide what's best for you. So it's important to speak with your proxy and to have the proxy filled out. So you don't just say, oh, I think Bruce would be a good proxy. You have to talk to Bruce about what your issues, what your wishes are if uh, future issues come up. And so Susan did that with Bruce. The documentation was completed and Bruce does carry it with him at all times. So if Susan needs something, he can speak on her behalf. Okay, so how quickly did you move through triage and get placed in the emergency room, a room in the emergency department? Okay, one of the things when you go into an emergency room in any hospital, it says, I think statistically, I saw an article that your average wait is four hours. So be prepared. The evening I took Susan, we got lucky. It was a very slow night. So we actually moved through triage very quickly. Great. Um, were you able to set up some sort of communication equipment or did the hospital provide you with some means of communication so that mm -hmm. Susan could speak to the um, nursing staff and the doctors? Now, that's a kind of important question when you bring someone in, especially if it's an ALS patient, because if they're non-communicative, like Susan is, uh, yeah, the hospital can get confused. They may think either Susan's intoxicated, she's uh, that she uh, is having a stroke. There's many things. The answer is yeah. We we had the communication device with us. I did most almost all the speaking in the beginning for Susan, but once we got ourselves settled later on, the communication device came out, and Susan was able to communicate what she wanted to say. What I do carry is a backup. They have what they call communication boards, which is almost like an alphabet on a board, and there's a that allows her to. It it takes a long time to do to use, but you can actually spell it. She could spell out what she wants to say. So in the event that I couldn't hook up the communication device, we do carry a communication board with us. Excellent. Okay. So you just touched base on a little bit of stuff. Let's just see, what did you have with you? Like, what did you take into the van with you when you were bringing Susan that night? Um, and what do you always have with you? So did you have a communication, the actual communication machine with you that at that time? Yeah. When you came in? Well, in, 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 in my case, Okay, that wherever Susan goes, that communication device goes, no matter what. So that's always with us anyway. Uh, what I took with me really was just my emergency bag because I knew I had my items in it, which we'll discuss later. And I have a separate bag, which I call my go everywhere bag, which I usually I'll throw in the car, which has a lot more materials, a lot of more items, which you'll see later in the bag. Uh, I could sustain I could sustain Susan for at least a full day from that bag. Excellent. And how about, I know Susan's on the um, non-invasive ventilator um, mm -hmm. most of the day. 
or night. Um, did you ha carry that with you to the um, hospital? No, the answer is no, because that's an interesting question, because you kind of assume that the hospital would have everything that they would need, no matter what. And what we found that in, this, in, in both trips, uh, the hospital did not have a cough assist anywhere in their facility. Uh, for, they didn't have the type of non-invasive machine Susan uses. They'll use a BiPAP, they'll substitute something. Um, lessons learned at minimum. I will always I throw the cough assist in the car just to have it. Okay, and so you didn't have the cough assist with you at that time no. either, right? No. So what did they offer you instead? They offered us uh, in the hospital. They offer they what they do is they substitute for the non-invasive ventilation. Uh, the respiratory team at the hospital used a BiPAP machine. What I okay. do carry in my emergency bag. Uh, in that binder are the settings for Susan's machine. So we don't have to start from ground zero. Uh, all her machine settings, her, her cough assist, for her non adventure those settings are with me so I can pass it on to the respiratory therapist. Yeah, but what did they use okay. instead so, of the cough assist? In the cough assist, they used a per percussion vest, or so which pounds on the chest. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, that and Susan didn't go well. So we had to stop that. Uh, right. It's, so for some patients, they do prefer the vest and um, it, some hospitals have the vest and they don't have a cough assist and some hospitals have a cough assist and don't have the vest and some have a, both and some have none. So if you are, this is a very good lesson to learn. If you um, or your, your patient is um, using devices that are not um, the everyday normal devices, you might want to bring it with you. So if you're calling 911, the family member that's going to follow the ambulance should carry those things in their car because 911 is not going to pick them up. Um, but Susan ended up trying the percussion vest and was not happy with it. So um, did you eventually go home or somebody come from home with the uh, cough assist? No, no, we didn't. No. no. Okay. Because um, that's another issue. No. Uh, when you bring a device in, from home that the it's not does not belong mm -hmm. to the hospital they you know they hospital um tech department has to um assess the equipment to make sure it's not going to blow a fuse or not going to explode or set you know set the hospital on fire and stuff like that so it's usually even if you bring it with you um it, you might not get to use it for several hours to the next day only because they want to check it out and make sure it's um properly functioning, which has been a complaint that I've heard from a lot of people um, over the years. Okay, so I also mentioned that Susan's being tube fed 100%. Now her tube was in, you know, a little funky situation and that's why you went to the emergency room. But did you have tube feeding supplies with you when you yes. went to the emergency room? Yeah, yeah. In, my, in my go everywhere bag, uh, I have, a, I, have a, I carry a full set of supplies or her, her syringes, her formula, uh, bottled water to purge the tube. So, you know, we were prepared to handle it. Uh, what Teresa said that, you know, we talked about with that uh, is that, you know, I let the people know what I had in there. Uh, when they, they, I told them what she was using for nutrition. Uh, they sent up a nutritionist. They didn't have the, I guess, the strength or the potency that Susan uses. So they took mine, they, the nutritionist took it, they looked at it and they told, they used hers. And then, uh, there was alternate ways to do it, but we kind of went on the theory of it, it ain't broken, don't fix it. She did well with the formulas we had. So uh, the one thing that they do, they do, they check periodically in the bag and the hospital did check is whatever you're bringing is within expiration date. Right, right. Um, uh, and I could add okay. one more thing that, sure. in that bag is the uh, medications. Uh, most of the hospitals have your basic medications, the blood pressures and the miscellaneous stuff. But Susan was on two ALS medications. I grabbed those with me. I did have those in my bag uh, and to let them know in there. So uh, what Teresa just mentioned, they're going to take your meds from you and they're going to, you know, to register them in the pharmacy. Uh, she has two medications that went, that are not normally on the shelf and these weren't. So. Right. right. ALS as a disease itself, if you're taking mm -hmm. um, any of the ALS medications, um, chances are the hospitals don't have them in their formulary and they will get them eventually, but it could be, um, you know, a day or two before they actually get them to your bedside. So you might want to always carry at least a 24 to 48 hour supply of medications um, for you. And then we know that the Radicava is on a schedule 
And if you are um, in the hospital during your period of time where you're supposed to be taking that 10 days of Radhakava, then make sure you get that, get it to the um, nursing staff so they can get it to the pharmacy for them to verify that it is in fact the medication that you're saying it is. That's why they take it from you. And then they will put it on the, the nursing drug pass schedule for the day um, or for your hospitalization. Um, so Bruce, now we're gonna go back to when you, now you're looking back, you spent a few days there and um, what did you not bring with you or what didn't you bring with you that you wish you had in the car? I, at this point, it really just boils down to the coffee assist machine. Uh, we had really everything. I didn't have to ask my kids to go home for anything, nor did I really run out of anything I needed. So in my uh, go everywhere bag, it's really everything I possibly needed for her. Excellent. Okay. So once you were in the emergency department and you were put in your little room behind a little curtain there, um, did the staff from the emergency room understand Susan's disease and the disease process? Uh, that, that's a tough topic. Okay. Because ALS, one of the things that we did when we, as soon as we got to the hospital and all the way through is, I mean, I just repeated everything about what the ALS persons, their limitations were. And so for Susan's safety, I mean, even if they knew it, okay, I just, you know, she's ALS. We told her about the breathing, the speech, the swallowing and the movement part. And it was an exercise we went through every single time we're there. Um, it's just kind of like the pos position that to be more of an educator than to guess. I mean, there is a lack of familiarity with ALS. Uh, when I took my own little surveys there, even with the nursing people, um, I asked them about their curriculums in nursing school uh, and covering ALS uh, just in general neurodegenerative diseases. I mean, it's just, I think it's growing, but it's not big part of the, of the uh, curriculum that they're familiar with. Um, we, and I guess our experience was unique. They were actually really interested in Susan. And at one point in the ER nurses, they came back after shift to learn more about the eye gaze and things. So our experience is like, you know, the the best thing I could say to people is, you know, it could be frustrating in the ER, um, but help offer solutions for the person and work with them. They were all, our experience was really not that bad. They were, they were willing to learn. Excellent. So tell me a little bit more about advocating for Susan, because as I said, Susan is, is not no longer able to speak and using one of those letter boards might be a little bit difficult for her to get her point across, especially when people are in an emergency room situation, they're in a hurry. Um, you know, they want to get the test done. They want to get her moved from place to place. So how did you advocate for Susan throughout her stay in the ED? Okay, because Susan can't communicate, okay, verbally, when you go into some of these testings, so you can't take the equipment, you can't take it with you. Uh, I was by her side through the whole time. We were there as her basic spokesperson. Uh, it also helps with the doctors because when she's kind of moaning or groaning because there's something she doesn't like, I can usually understand what she wants. So you can work through and you're helping them get through or to understand what the needs are. Uh, like, for example, when she went for her CAT scan, uh, they asked me if I'd like to come along. Absolutely. So I went there until the point where they put her onto the table into the CAT scan. But when they were putting her onto the CAT scan table, I just reminded them that, you know, you can't pull her by her arms. There's parts of the week. You just have to be careful what we usually do. Uh, everybody was very, in our case, they were positive. It was a positive experience. Uh, and then we just wait outside. I'm glad to hear that. And it's important, you know, like, Susan can't move her arm to lift herself onto the chair. And mm -hmm. the fact that you were ex explaining that to them actually probably saved them a lot of time that, you know, they stopped and listened to you. That's a good thing mm -hmm. to hear that they did. Yeah, All the right. Only, the only delay we have is that time was there twice. There was emergency cases that came into, oh. okay. So you get put on, but you can't get angry at them. No, okay? no, no. You have to just, just bring a book. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. So, you know, you always have to put the, mm -hmm more emergent mm -hmm. situation. And thank God that you weren't in, you weren't the emergency. Nope. You were just trying to get something figured out. All right. So now the doctors have been to the bedside. They've ordered a lot of tests. Susan went and came back from various tests and they finally decide to admit her. So now you're packing everything up that you brought and they bring her to another part of the hospital into a regular hospital room. How much of Susan's medical history and the, the ALS symptoms, the nonverbal, the non being able to move, um, were 
passed on from the ED nursing station to the um, hospital floor station. I mean, if you get, I mean, there's always going to be, there's going to be gaps in there. So, I mean, like, you know, at this point, I think you just have to be more proactive in sense, like, you know, advocating for your patient and just, I had no problem reviewing everything again with every staff that's there. And it's not just in the moving, okay? The red light goes on, the flesh light goes on, is also a shift change where a new staff comes in. And also as the hospital, as the days go on, you may not have the same people. So you're going to be constantly going, I constantly repeated what I had to say about what Susan's limitations were with the ALS. And I, it was, uh, they were receptive. They had more questions than I had answers. So Bruce, tell me a little bit about the sign that you post above um, Susan's bed when she was in the hospital. Okay, we have a sign there. It says, you know, I have ALS. And it tells, it, there's a couple of check boxes. I think Teresa has a picture of it. Which, I'm going to try to put it up later, but I don't know if I'll be able to get it okay. there. Okay, there's a sign on there. It has basic things about, you know, I can't move my legs. I can't, I communicate. I, I can't communicate. Um, it has, um, it talks about, uh, it's just a little checklist. And then what you do is I just kind of fill out a couple of extra things on there where it says, I can't communicate. And I have on her sign, I communicate through an augmentative device. Um, I leave a copy of that sign where it's visible to whoever's coming into the room. So, you know, they know that there's a limitation there. Also, what I do there is if I have to step out, uh, I always leave, I'll be right back and I leave my, my number where they can contact me. So, but. Uh, and that sign, I believe, has your mm -hmm. contact number on it too. Yes, it the does. One it has, on the wall. So, um, as uh, you know, in, in my earlier career, before I dealt with ALS exclusively, I did work in um, critical care and we constantly posted things on the wall above the patient's bed, like patient is hard of hearing, patient can't lay on their left side, patient needs to stand to toilet, whatever it might have been, but we would communicate to the staff that way um, so that they would know they, you know, have to keep them on their right side or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so Bruce did mention this sign to me um, when we were putting this uh, little presentation together. And he said, I don't know if I was allowed to do it, but I hung it on the above her bed um, at, at the head of the bed. And I said, well, that was the perfect place to put it because that's where we always communicate with, with each other. Um, you know, we always post signs up there. So nurses and medical staff, the x-ray technician, the dietitian, whoever's going into the room, they kind of look above the, the, um, above the head of the bed onto the wall to see, is there a special diet? Is there, you know, patient praise every day at four o'clock, so I shouldn't bother them, whatever it might be. So it was the perfect place to put it. And I'm sure if um, people do go to our website and download that sign, um, they can carry it with them and they can post it on the head of the bed, any place that they go going forward. Okay, so um, now Susan's been in the hospital a day or so and the doctors have reviewed all of their testing that they've done and they've brought in other specialists and they decide that they're going to um, do a procedure, some procedures on Susan. And um, she hasn't had any procedures done in this hospital since her diagnosis with, the, with ALS. So the doctors are gonna talk to you and your family. Um, did they openly discuss what they wanted, what kind of procedures they wanted to do? And you know the amount of anesthesia and the amount of time and things like that with you and your family? Yeah, absolutely, that was a long discussion. And then so we had the various you know disciplines there that were required between cardiology, pulmonology, and whoever was gonna be involved in this procedure, there was two options that we went through. But uh, when we went through the options, I mean, one of the options was uh, we required her to be intubated during the surgery procedure. ALS and anesthesia and deep anesthesia are not friends. So we kind of took the position that, you know, after speaking with the doctors and consulting with them, that the less invasive procedure that required a less, a more milder anesthesia, we take a chance at that, and that uh, they were pretty confident that it would be successful. Uh, what they did tell us, though, that uh, and they were very clear on it, is that because of the uh, option of the one of the options discussed after incubation, they had told us that there would be a fifty percent possibility that she'd be on a respirator for life after the procedure. So we, as a family, decided that, and Susan included, uh, that uh, we're going to take the less risk option, and we were successful. Okay, so I'm just gonna explain intubation for anybody who doesn't understand that. When 
when one goes under anesthesia, deep anesthesia, um, they, you, your body doesn't breathe so well. So the anesthesiologist will put a tube down your throat and attach it to a ventilator. And that machine will breathe for you during the procedure. And most people will have that tube removed at the end of the, um, the whatever surgery is happening um, once they start recovering and the anesthesia actually flushes out of your system quite well. But um, for patients who have compromised respiratory status, like many of our ALS patients, putting that tube down and clearing the anesthesia and the patient breathing back on their own may not happen so uh, quickly or it may not ever happen. And that tube down your throat would end up being attached to a ventilator um, to support your breathing. And then a patient may need to have a tracheostomy done to, um, to continue to breathe with the assistance of a machine. So that that was the issue. Um, and did the doctors talk to Susan about that? Was she active in that decision making? Absolutely. Okay. And it's important to know that, you know, just because Susan can't speak, that the doctor should be there at the bedside and they should be patiently um, conversing with Susan or any of the patients. And did they allow your two adult sons to participate in that conversation? Absolutely. And Susan allowed them, you know, Susan wanted them involved? Oh, yeah, our family is very close. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So how many days was Susan hospitalized? Uh, about 10 days because of and, the procedure. Um, yeah. So how, how many days into the hospitalization before she had the procedure? Uh, I'm going to say about six, seven days. Okay. And then the, based on the diagnosis to see exactly what was happening, that took a little bit of time. And then once they decided the, what, what was going on, what procedure to go, it we were out like two days later. Excellent. Um, so she did start feedings again with the new feeding tube. Yep. Um, they made sure everything worked okay. So um, how long did you, Bruce, spend at Susan's bedside? I was there 100% of the time. I, okay. I just felt that, you know, being you know, the caregiver, being the spouse, that, you know, and her inability to communicate, that that, that was going to be critical to her, her care. Okay. So I'm just going to, like, talk to people now just about going to the emergency room. You know, Bruce's situation is a classic situation where you go in, you think maybe there's just a little something going on with the stomach, and then she ends up being in the hospital for 10 days. So not every emergency room visit is go in, stay there a couple of hours, get sent home with, you know, a cast or some medication or, you know, referral to another doctor. So families and caregivers should be ready for this hospitalization situation or an extended period in the emergency room if you do have an ill patient. Um, friends and neighbors should always be aware that they may be on call to be there to jump in to care for the children or to adult family members that may be living with the, um, the, the patient's family. Um, and maybe even pets need to be cared for, not maybe, all, all these people need to be cared for. So you should have a local person. Now in Bruce's situation, he has two adult sons that could run over if they, I don't know if they even have a pet, but your, your family may be wanting to be at the emergency room. So you should know somebody who's local, um, a next door neighbor down the block. And then also for kids in the school, the school should be aware that the parent or grandparent is sick and there may be times where there's this hospitalization um, may take place. So there might be a different person um, picking up that child from school or receiving the child off the bus. These are always problems that you have to anticipate. And I know the school has a backup plan all the time for situations like this. So be, um, you know, upfront with the school that, oh my gosh, be upfront with the school that the, um, that the children may, their parent or grandparent or relative may end up in the emergency room. Um, so now, also when you're going to the emergency room, I'm sorry, the lights just went out, hold on. <laughs> um, when you go to an emergency room, you wanna always have a little um, non-perishable safe food in the home for the family members left behind in case the, the one who cooks the meals is not available to cook them because they're either in the emergency room themselves or taking somebody there. And um, make sure that the children or other family members that are in the home have the contact names and numbers of the friends and family who are set up to participate in the care of that person um, or the, the people staying at home. All right, 
So Bruce, can you tell us about, uh, you told us about the stuff that you brought with you for Susan and that you carry with you when you go to a doctor's appointment or when you go out for the day, but what about for yourself? Were you prepared to be there for a couple of days and what did you have for your own self? No, I, I didn't have that much. I just had a couple of, I keep a couple of protein bars or, you know, like those kind bars in the case. I mean, there's enough, there's, there's uh, vending machines and there's cafeterias there. So that was, well, my kids would bring me stuff. Food to eat. I mean, I, I didn't look at it as important, but the uh, there's a couple of things in just in case. And if I needed water or so, so the, 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 I had I had to hold extra water bottles plus the hospital. If I asked them for something, they would give it to me. So very good. So the um, it's important. I don't know if you take a medication on a daily basis, mm. but um, if you do, did you have it with you? Do you have a little bottle of or a little one yeah. of those weekly packs? Yeah, I had a, I had a couple of day supply. All right. So um, no one really wants to go to the emergency room and nobody, you know, it's not one of the things on the top of everybody's uh, list of things to do this week. Um, but every patient and caregiver should find out that things will find that things run calmer and smoother when you have open conversation, open communication with the staff. And if the staff says to you, we'll be back in a few minutes, then let the staff um, step away and then, um, you know, Keep an eye on them. And if they don't come back in a little while, you know, wave them down. But don't try to um, hold on to them at your bedside for the whole time because um, that could dis disrupt the entire um, flow of the emergency room visit for not just you and your patient, but other members, uh, other patients um, in the ER. So Bruce has pr provided, us a, provided us with a few pearls of wisdom that gave us the inside look to the emergency room and a visit in a hospital for a few days. So thanks so much, Bruce, for your insight. Um, I'm going to uh, pull up Bruce's slides, uh, Bruce's um, recommendations of things to carry with him and with us when we go to the emergency room. And we'll um, go over this. So can you see that? Yes. Okay. So Bruce, I'm gonna let you go through some of the things that you have in the um, in your backpack. And one of the things that Bruce does carry in his backpack is an emergency binder. And he um, he told me that that binder came into play when the doctors were asking a little medical history. And you know you're a little um, befuddled when they're asking a bunch of things, and the doctors ask questions that you were like, "Why are they asking that question?" But um, Bruce, tell us how the binder came into play. Oh, the binder! Uh, it's, it's it's from one of my medical uh, events uh, years back. I put the binder together. The kids and everybody thought it was funny, but when the doctor came out and asked a question, it was in there. So once Susan started with this journey. Uh, I actually put her binder together, and it's just important to make sure that you know this is the basic list that's on that my binder contains. And in the case of like the uh, healthcare proxy, the power of attorney, uh, those the placards, um, usually I'll keep two three copies in that binder in case I have to give one out, just in case it doesn't come back. Uh, this way, I have an extra one. I have one with me, um, but uh, this is critical. Um, my mine is just on a simple computer spreadsheet. Then make a project of it. The important thing is though is to make sure that you keep it updated. Just pencil in any changes in the binder, and uh, keep it current. Excellent. And another thing to point out, thank you, Bruce. Is healthcare proxy and advanced directives. You can make photocopies. The photocopy is just as um, good as um you know the original one so always have a copy um i carry mine in my um one is in my glove box in my car and the other one is hanging on my refrigerator at home um all right how about this is something that was um nice when i saw this i was like oh yeah we have to communicate and our phone dies 24 hours after we get there so these this was um important stuff so tell us about this Oh, this is just a basic communication. This is personalized, whatever you, you know, what's good for you, the communication board, just common sense. The cell phone's going to be used no matter what. Earbuds, just to keep it private, not to disturb other people. And just the basic stuff, the phone charger, you know, I don't, masks are optional, but I do use mine. And depending on basic stuff, on the phone charger, I just recommend having a 
a long cord because when we were in the ER, I was watching these people plug uh, their charges in with the wire across patients there. I mean, it's just, it gets, it was kind of comical, but basic stuff, whatever you feel comfortable with, but this would be the basic the minimum. Excellent. Thank you. All right. So we did bring this up before, um, you know, bring your medication, bring your pa the patient's medication and your medication. Um, and then caregiver needs. So the caregiver has to think about themselves. You can't be a caregiver for very long if you ignore yourself. And then Bruce mentioned that he did bring a, a few snack bars with him. He always has them packed and water bottles. That's important. You know, like you can't depend on the staff in the emergency room or when you get up to a, a bed, you can't depend on the staff to be providing you with all sorts of stuff. So bring a little bit of stuff with you. Um, this is important for the caregiver, right, Bruce? Yep, yep. So uh, I'm sure that uh, the patient gets a little emergency kit. You know, when they get to the hospital, they maybe have a little bottle of mouthwash or a little toothbrush, but they don't give one to the caregiver. And then this was important. I like that Bruce put down that he has money and change, especially for the vending machines. That always happens. You have a $20 bill. And at two o'clock in the morning, there's nobody around to give you any change. So, you know, always have a pile of uh, quarters in the bottom of that backpack. And then I added this to your list, um, phone number of friends and family and backup care providers, because it's important that you let one person know, so you don't have to call 50 people. You let one person and ask them to call others. And you make sure you know who's going to pick up the kids, who's going to feed the dog, um, you know, and the, things like that. So for the patient, for the ALS patient, Bruce carries, what do you have with you? Um, oh, I, I just told him my gold bag. This is like a jumbo backpack that has everything I could possibly need in there. This is where I have her extra formula, her water, her syringes, uh, some extra clothes and whatever, just everything else I possibly need. I mean, it, some people found it comical. I think Teresa did where I actually carry a pair of long nose pliers because of the feeding tube. If you have that little blue cap at the bottom of the syringe and you go to pull it out, the cap stays in there, that little blue cap. I use the mm -hmm. syringe to pull it out. I've never gotten stuck uh, over the over, since we started this journey of not having what I need to keep Susan functioning. Okay, excellent. All right, so some of this stuff is, um, you know, Bruce has two bags and some are in each bag. Um, you know, I like that nail file because uh, I'm constantly breaking my fingernail and then it gets caught on something else. So I wish I had a nail file all the time with me. Um, then Bruce brings uh, little garbage bags with him and um, little cleaning supplies for the tube feeding and stuff like that. You know, clearly in the hospital, they'd probably be able to give you some of these supplies. But, you know, when you're going somewhere else uh, and, you know, you go into the doctor's office, you might not have all these supplies and it's good to have everything. Um, and then here, Bruce did not, you didn't have the all calm device at first, the Toby, or you did, I can't remember. Sorry. Sorry. When you went to the emergency room that particular time, did you have the Toby with you or not? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So, and you do have a second, you have a battery backup and you have a charging yeah. cable. Did they yeah. inspect the Toby to make sure it was okay for you to use? No, they just no. Looked at it. they just thought it was a computer. They didn't care. It doesn't. It wasn't plugged into anything that was going to hurt them. Okay, and here's an important one: the hearing aid batteries. When somebody needs, when somebody's using a hearing aid and their batteries go, you may as well just put them in a corner and yell at them. They they can't hear anything you're saying. So that's important to have those hearing aid batteries. Um. So yeah, this is a gate belt. That's important. Um to have with you and a flashlight. And there's that multi-tool that um, Bruce spoke about. So these are two, two separate bags have their own little lists. Um, but I just wanted to show you that Bruce is always well-prepared. Oh, and the formula, the prescribed formula. So like Bruce mentioned, when they got to the emergency room, the formula that Susan was on and tolerating well that particular hospital did not carry the formula. So hospitals contract with, um, you know, companies to provide feeding, you know, they say they negotiate prices. And so they, one hospital may use a different formula than another. And um, 
Susan may not tolerate that other formula. So it was nice that Bruce did have a couple of bottles of the prescribed formula. And then um, that sign that we talked about earlier, and maybe there, you know, a little card that you could have that um, Susan could have with her at all time. A communication board, which Bruce mentioned before, is like a letter board that Susan would be able to point um, to the letters or indicate what she's looking for. And then, uh, yeah, the lens wipes for the glasses and the screens um, to make sure everything stays readable. Because when you're using a Allcom device, your glasses need to be clean and the Allcom needs to be clean so that you, the communicator can use them. And then Bruce always has a notebook and pens with him to make sure he can take notes. And that's an important thing. You know, the doctor comes in and wants to tell you something. You want to write it down. You find you're writing on a used napkin or something. So yeah, have that notebook with you. So I do want to say a special thanks to Bruce yeah. and Susan for allowing us to dig deep into their emergency situation and um, to share their learning experiences with us. Um, I'm going to let people ask us questions and um, hopefully we can help you guys with um, some Would questions. You, with as, a close, as a close, can we put up that I have ALS slide? Well, I'm going to try that while people are asking questions, okay? I have a copy in case you can't have a... Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you both so much for that really informative um, presentation. Um, Bruce, it's so clear what um, a dedicated caregiver you are, um, along with your amazing family. Um, but unfortunately, there are some people that don't have um, advocates as you and family as you. And are there any specific recommendations if for either of you, if um, if you're alone and if you don't have anyone to sort of advocate, if there's anything that someone needs to maybe do in advance, if they know that they they could be facing an emergency. And, and one question that came in was, what happens when like during the pandemic, nobody is allowed to accompany the patient? That's where I think that book and that information becomes important that you have it. So if you can't communicate or you have someone, that information is all of it as much as you need for a medical reason. The, the that book is important becomes a very important thing on your med, on your medical history. Thank you. Yeah, that that um, book was Bruce. During that time, you know, that was a good way for um, the doctors mm -hmm. to be able to get the questions answered. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that was that is a good thing to carry with you. And also um, that slide that I can't seem to pull up um, does have contact information, a number on it. And it has you a to, you want me to show a copy of it? I do have a copy. You want me to pop one up? Sure. Let's see if we can do it. Uh... And Donna. Um, okay, that's your slide. Yeah, there you go. Oh, yeah. there you go. Okay. Yeah, so see how it is nice and easy, the like six or eight questions answered right there on the screen. So I cannot breathe when I lie flat. I use NIV or cough assist to help me breathe. Do not give me O2, um, which is a situation prescribed for, for our patients. I understand what you're saying because a lot of times people will say, oh, they can't speak, they must not understand me. And they, I, you, I communicate using. these. This is all very basic, simple stuff. And then <clears throat> at the bottom, you see it says, call, ask me or call my caregiver for more information. So during COVID, that would have been a beautiful thing for the patient to be able to have taped to their shirt, pinned to their shirt when they went to the, in the ER um, before, you know, his family was saying goodbye. Um, and that could have been pinned on them or right on top of their belongings. Uh, you know, it should be front and center. Okay, yeah, important news is, is this, this first one, which we have on that last slide about oxygen in the ER, going into the ER. Maybe you wanna speak about that a little bit. Yes, That's and that fine. actually is another question um, that someone had has asked. Um, what to do if your loved one is placed on oxygen and the doctor or nurse insists that they need it, but you know that that's not the um, that's not the appropriate um, means of that that's not something that they should be doing. 
So my recommendation, first of all, is to have the family member call their ALS um, clinics uh, doctor or nurse or whomever at the ALS clinic and have them speak to the doctor or nurse in the emergency room and say to them, look, this is the reason we don't provide this. Uh, we don't want oxygen. But you can always, you know, if they say to you, uh, we want you to drink uh, this aspirin and you don't like aspirin, it causes an upset stomach, maybe it gives you a rash. You say, no, I don't take aspirin. You have the right to say no to anything that they do, want you to do in the hospital. So if they say, we want to put this oxygen on you, you can say, no, I, I, do, I refuse to take it. And that's okay. People have the right to say yes and no to things that they, you know, the doctor is recommending. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things, I mean, like I, I, actually Teresa taught us from the Zoom is like, you know, at the ER, if they wanted to put the oxygen on it, one of the comeback questions would be is did you measure their carbon dioxide levels? If your carbon dioxide levels are, are, are increasing, to me, that's an indicator that, you know, there could be another problem. That's where the doctors have to help make the decision. But again, going back to what I said originally, you have to offer solutions also there as their advocate. So, I mean, this is things that, I mean, from the Zooms and the, I speak for Long Island Zooms, uh, these are things that we talked about. And then Teresa had raised this, I'm going back a long time already. So I know that's a very important thing. Um, and that goes back to like, you know, when you're bringing a person in that has ALS, non-communicative, this and that. I mean, the, I mean, in the times we live, you know, is it a, are they on drugs? Are they on fentanyl? Are they having a stroke? There's so many things that the doctors go through. But that's why advocating for that person is extremely, extremely important in understanding. Um, oxygen and ALS may not be the right thing for them. And actually, if you give them the oxygen, it may be telling the brain to say, hey, this is easy. I don't have to do this anymore. Let's stop breathing. We got it coming free. So I, I my my bottom line recommendation is have that doctor or nurse, or you can pick up the call the phone and call your ALS uh, clinic and then ask them to speak to the doctor. Next, what's the next question, Don? Okay. Are 911 ambulance patients given priority over walk-ins when going to the ED? Um, this person said that they went to they once went by ambulance on a stretcher, given the time it takes to get them in their power chair and van, and it seemed that they did get seen more quickly than others, even though their issue was not necessarily as critical. Um, that's interesting. So like Bruce mentioned before, when um, Susan was in the ED, uh, she was swept in because they were, you know, kind of having a slow day. And <clears throat> when, um, but when some other emergencies came in, they were put in front of Susan for a CAT scan or whatever test Susan were going was going to. So whenever an ambulance comes through the door at an emergency room, the staff turns around and checks out what's going on in the ambulance. They'll bring that person in on a stretcher. The ambulance staff has already gotten done the triage and has gotten the um, first set of uh, issues addressed. And then they will pass it on to the emergency room. They have to leave. The ambulance crew has to leave. So the emergency room department, emergency room staff has to take that patient from them. So they will run and pay attention to them. But if there's somebody across the hall with a gunshot wound or isn't breathing or somebody in the midst of having a heart attack, once they get that patient that was just brought into the emergency room settled down, they are going to take their attention back to the more urgent situation. So they, they need to relieve the emergency room, I mean, the ambulance of their duties. And that's why they're seen immediately. Great. Thanks, Teresa. Um, you, Bruce, you said you wanted a milder anesthetic for the surgery. Did that also include the tube going down the throat or was there a choice? This person did, I, I didn't hear the... I don't remember if they put the tube down the throat. Quite often that they would, they'll put a, in surgery, they'll put a tube down for an emergency use, but not to support her breathing. And, I don't know the answer to that. And they want to know what the actual procedure Susan ended up having. I do think you explained that, but maybe if you could go into a little more detail. Um, yeah, I mean, right now, right now, there was a problem with the tube and some, 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 some of Susan's anatomy and what happened with the tube. So it got a little bit more complicated on how to do it because it's just how it's just like she has a little bit of, I guess, a weird anatomy in there. And 
how the tube got misplaced or so over time. It had nothing to do with, it wasn't a catastrophic tube failure. I want to emphasize, don't be scared of a peg tube. I think this is like, I, I, Teresa has, we said, oh, one in a thousand or one in 10,000 have what she had. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's anomaly. Yeah. Over the nearly 30 years that I've been dealing with ALS patients, I've never seen that before. And um, so she did have to have her tube removed mm -hmm. and a new tube put in. And mm -hmm. they, I believe, probably looked around inside mm -hmm. her uh, abdominal cavity while they were doing the procedure mm -hmm. to make sure um, there were no further issues and maybe patch a little thing up. Mm -hmm. So in general, when somebody's getting a feeding tube, it can be done with a very mild amount of um, sedation which we call conscious sedation, where you actually, the patient can almost respond to questions while they're sedated. Um, but, you know, they're really, their brain is kind of like, oh, good, they're putting a tube in me. Um, and so they don't have to put a tube down your throat to, um, to assist your breathing. So um, likely that's what happened with Susan. They gave her a much lighter um, amount of sedation, but they did do an investigative procedure on her. So it was probably a little bit greater than the general feeding tube procedure. And yeah. someone did make a comment that um, if you if you go to the emergency room, it's definitely important to let your clinic coordinator know. And you know, I most certainly agree with that. I and mean, that's probably even something you want to have on you know in that emergency binder. Um, and in terms of, you know, when you call 911, um, you know, unfortunately, in in these emergencies, you know, you can't really, you, you don't always have the option of being able to determine which, you know, hospital you go to. And um, you, you know, you're, they're going to take you to the hospital that they want you to go to. I mean, of course, there are things you can do, like, you know, use a private emergency service, but um, just to know that they are going to take you just to the nearest hospital emergency room. And um, that's sort of, you know, where you're going to end up. Um, with that being said, are there ever, are there ever times when, um, for, for specific for ALS patients, if they should not go to an emergency room, if it's something that they can deal with potentially at home, to avoid the stress of an ER visit. And like Bruce said, the, sometimes the lack of knowledge that you know those, in, those who work in the hospitals unfortunately don't have. So sometimes people are actively involved with a home care program and that home care program may have a nursing um, uh, situation where the nurse comes once a month or once a week or whatever. And I would say first and foremost, have a nurse come into the home and assess the situation and decide whether or not they feel it's really emergent for them to get to an emergency room. Some people do have um, home uh, medical programs. You know, there are visiting doctors programs. And if people do feel like they may, um, you know, as the disease progresses, need more visits from a doctor and can't get out, they might want to get themselves set up with a home, um, you know, uh, visiting doctor program which they're all over the tri-state area. Right, that's yeah. that's really helpful to know. Thanks, it, Teresa. And, and, and like, you know, although it sounds, uh, it, I guess it sounds simple what I went through, but in the background, uh, my first call when all this was happening was to Teresa, and that got also expanded to the ALS clinic doctor. And I know even you, through the visit, you were kind of the intermediary to keep Teresa and the doctor updated on what Susan's progress was. If I had a question, that was my go-to. Teresa was my first go-to. And uh, she would be the community. I mean, the doctors are busy, but the, the mechanism is there to make sure that the ALS patient in the clinic gets the right care. And I think that's what we had in Susan. So. Yeah. I think it's I'm sorry. I just want to say that I, I have had many a patient end up in the hospital and they're in the hospital for days or weeks situations change and I don't know anything about it because I spoke to them on Friday the 3rd they go into the hospital on Saturday the 4th and the next time I would reach out to them was maybe be a few weeks later just to follow up if whatever we talked about happened or didn't happen and um, then I find out oh yeah they've been in the hospital for three weeks and whatever 
So it is important for us to um, have that communication with all of the patients. So even if you just send a text message or an email or leave a voicemail over the weekend on their work um, you know, email or voicemail, then um, uh, just so the staff knows, the, the clinic staff knows, and maybe we can be a little bit more involved. Great. I want to really thank you both. Um, you know, I personally know both of you and um, I really, really enjoy working with both of you. You're both so informative. And I just really want to thank you for this really wonderful um, presentation. Um, again, I just want everyone to know that all of these summit presentations have been recorded and they will be on our website. Um, probably, I would say, early next week. Um, and I do hope that you guys um, stay on. Our next um, presentation begins at 12 and it's about accessibility. So, you know, again, thank you all for coming and um, I hope you enjoyed the presentation as much as we did. Thank you for having us. Thank you.